This is the Dead Horse uh, Podcast, and with me I have Vivek Ramkumar. Hey guys, Ashwin Sudhir. Namaste. And because he has to be last, uh, Arvind. <laughs> Hello. And uh, it's uh, this week we're going to discuss what we personally think the Indian games industry should do to establish an identity for itself, and what we personally, again, would like that identity to be. Uh, this is in context of how generally Japan is known for its RPGs, its art styles, and a lot of over-the-top gameplay mechanics. And, you know, how would we like to see this, you know, currently nascent industry grow? So uh, let's start with Arvind, because you've always got an opinion. I guess it's at an this point, it really that just needs to persevere rather, like, rather than trying to orchestrate some kind kind of effort that they you know to give every game a unique personality rather than that just uh, because a lot of our scene what usually happens here is that the, a team comes together they make a couple of games and then uh, because that game isn't very successful so then they break apart and then go back to working for something else so yeah i think at, at this moment it just needs a bit of stability but yeah that's easier said than done i guess all righty um, do you have anything else to add to that, or uh, is that more or less it? Games that don't suck. Oh wow, that's that's broad, but okay. Uh, <laughs> what about you, Ashwin? When I when I think about this, I, I think we, we for for us to have a style of our own, because I think that's what you're hinting at. We need mm-hmm. a local market. I think that is the first thing that should be there for us to organically evolve something. Uh, right. Evolve. So when you look at the Japanese, I don't think they set out to make uh, this kind of a game or that kind of a game. This happened over time because of their interactions with their audience. They have an audience in Japan, and that's their primary audience probably. And ditto with other games like European games. There are many series which are eminently popular in Europe in their local markets. I can think of adventure games that are hugely popular in Germany, but not so much in the rest of the English-speaking world. Similarly, the Gothic series uh, and many others. So these had their roots in their local markets, which which gave them a voice of their own, and these evolved into global brands. So for mm-hmm. us to uh, develop a style of our own, I think the first criterion is that we should have a, a local market. Once we get a strong enough local market, just like our movies have a certain flavor to them, I think our games yeah. will also have a certain kind of flavor. Um, to build on that, uh, just hypothetically, what sort of uh, style how would you us building given the sort of games that a lot of Indian gamers do play currently? Well, I wouldn't really. I'm not brave enough to predict what kind of thing would evolve here. Okay. Yeah, but I, I think we might have a very distinct art style of our own. Uh, mm-hmm. It's debatable whether our art styles. Let's look at Amar Chitra Katha for, for an example. That's probably a right. very Indian style that we have. It's debatable whether it will be universally it will be universally appealing, but that's certainly an identity that we have. So similar to that, I think we might evolve our own art style, our own way of uh, maybe dialogue writing, heavily influenced by the cultural references that we have already, which is our movie industry. So even today, when when I do my day to day work in office, interestingly, uh, when when we decide where to place our cameras, how the cameras should cut from action to action, uh, when, when right. combat happens, when a sword swing happens. I see that the input that I get from people, and these people come from the, the VFX industry, the Indian movie industry, and they right. their opinions are heavily governed by the Indian movie industry. They would look at a movie sequence, an over-the-top movie sequence, and would want the cameras placed according to that. So I think that will probably be your biggest influence, and our games, once they have a local market, might follow the movie industry in, in, in presentation and style. That's that's a guess. Okay. Mm, but if you were to go by the Indian gamer stereotype, that's usually Counter-Strike and Dota and usually multiplayer games. Yeah, it, it's very, it, it's centered around uh, group experiences. Yeah. Competitive. And, yeah, and competitive like, groups. You experience. couldn't possibly think of a different, like it's pretty diametrically opposite to the Bollywood and like song and dance kind of thing that 
like it's usually yeah but again uh, arvind what you're talking about is affluent like relatively well to do people who play video games right mm-hmm. once we have the pen- market penetration that something like bollywood has or something like the regional cinema has where in you know in, in hyderabad when a certain when a ramcharan teja movie comes out everybody in hyderabad goes to watch it or everybody even in rural andhra will go to watch it when you right. have that kind of penetration that diversity of taste that will come out will allow different kind of things to get made exactly i think the, these gamers you talked about counter strike and uh, the online gamers basically they have they probably prefer hollywood movies to bollywood movies that's just a guess but given a choice uh, i feeling that most people that i know who play counter strike or uh, other multiplayer games I, i i feel that they would rather watch an english movie than an hindi than a hindi movie uh i would beg to differ because like i've been going to cafes uh since i was in high school and i i'm pretty clued into the crowd that goes there and they're like it's a mix but he just has established that he's a member of a cool kids I, group <laughs> that was, yeah, yeah i would digress <laughs> I would digress because I have uh, I've been going to net cafe since I was in high school and a lot of the crowd there are pretty normal Indians in that they you know like their uh, Bollywood movies uh yeah they do enjoy Hollywood but they have a you know, what you see in uh, Bollywood and they're very clued into general references you know like uh, uh dialogues that we quote from uh, or at least you guys more than me quote from old Hindi movies so I I, I Yeah so I think we do have a, a a good population of gamers it's just that what's available to them is you know nothing that kind of resonates and also I think it's um just we don't have anything of the quality that they expect because when gaming started in India we, it was already you know pretty far progressed elsewhere so you know the bar is a little bit higher from what most people expect uh vivek what do you think not just because of the uh, high quality bar that's been set but also because in general in terms of uh, culture indians aren't used to being uh, you know they are not used to being trend setters bollywood has its own identity because film in india started at a very very early point in time of film itself so there was no expectation set for people in india as to what films should be but our audience essentially in terms of video games we look to the west to set the bar right or we look to the west to set trends we don't look to ourselves to you know break the mold in anything it's something ashwin told me once and like you know we not we don't look on our look on ourselves in india as people who make products like or people who make anything that's individual and uh, individualistic and unique they we consume those things from other cultures certainly but the the idea that we can make those things hasn't been ingrained in us yet our attitude is if something's made here we look at it with a healthy amount of sex uh, skepticism <laughs> so <laughs> wow talk about freud and slips vivek we i don't i don't want you to edit that one out i agree that there is a lot of skepticism with uh with how a lot of indians would perceive stuff we've created like even if it's genuinely good the first reaction is it's probably going to suck yeah that's there for sure and the the other thing i found is that uh, i mean even if you're talking about these these counter strike like the counter strike playing crowd right mm-hmm. i don't necessarily believe that if someone plays counter strike or enjoys playing a lot of counter strike that necessarily means they're not going to play a game like beyond two souls or to take the indian equivalent what are we making right now unrest uh <laughs> I I don't necessarily think that that means those those two kinds of gamers are mutually exclusive. Uh uh no, like, especially of late because you know uh good computers are becoming more and more affordable. So, you know, uh, yeah. at least big budget titles that you hear about a lot in the news, those people will go home and play this, but most of the time that they do spend gaming is, you know, in groups because, you know, it's it's just the way that you uh you know a lot of people spend time is that you know you have a group of friends you hang out and everybody plays games then yeah but the other thing like I, the other thing i think i don't know if if you guys will agree with this but in my view uh for for us to have our own identity what's going to have to happen is a like a series of people or a group of people are going to have to start making games that get lauded by the west 
and once we have approval from consumers in the west consumers back home will automatically give us a free pass at least a couple of times like you know yeah. so then you have an audience here that you can kind of depend on to sell your games to that makes sense but okay here's the question then like once again extremely hypothetical what direction would you like to see this go if you know we start building identity where would you like to see it go um ashwin well uh, where would i like to see it quality the first yeah. thing would be quality yeah okay we just have to we just have to tell our guys that chalta hai won't work i think i've seen a lot of that not just in the gaming industry but a lot of our general attitude we don't try 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 to be the best we see we we are seeing changes there so maybe 10 years back we wouldn't have seen a flipkart or a paytm or a zomato these, yeah. these are services which which are really polished and I think we had this at one time as a culture. If you look at the 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 artifacts that we have from from a long time ago, uh, like 15th, 16th century, yeah. you see piece of the 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 artisanship that went into making these sort of things, the amount of polish that went into this. But it seems to me somehow that we lost that attitude somewhere around the line, and we we kind of getting it back. Uh, we we do see products that that are polished. to a level of quality that is universally acceptable so i think once that happens we should be in a good place yeah. i i like the point you make that in antiquity we that we had a lot of uh you know a lot of perfection in both our architecture and even in you know in in a lot of aspects of our lives and that has been lost but what what i find surprising though is that uh, a lot of uh you know people that you talk to they like to uh, tout antiquity saying that yeah we used to be this great but then when it comes to things they do uh like the, you know you don't see that same attitude uh, they do actually have that very chalta hai you know let it go whatever uh just get it done doesn't matter if it's good or not sort of attitude so that yeah i i do find that interesting um what about you arvin what would you like to say about the quality stuff i don't know like i think on one hand you also have budget and stuff to consider like we are we aren't working with the same amount of budget or uh, like at this moment the talent isn't as well ex- like as experienced and established like mm-hmm. so i don't know like on one hand yeah we have one hand like we definitely need to improve but i don't think it can be done by just willing it to happen you know all right and vivek well to an extent I, i don't know i i disagree to an extent it can't be done just by willing it to happen but it depends on how you define willing if willing by willing you mean there are going to have to be at least one generation of game developers that strap themselves with dynamite and run it a brick wall and keep making games until something gives why do you keep making yeah. suicide bomb references since you moved to saudi arabia <laughs> not moved to saudi arabia i'm in pune right now which should scare you uh, <laughs> uh that that be that said like that said aside uh suicide bombing aside which is you know my part time vocation since i moved to saudi arabia uh just a little casual <laughs> racism for our podcast the you even get the country wrong by the way it's united arab emirates not saudi arabia oh, yeah. okay yeah uh, <laughs> right whatever same thing yeah no <laughs> same thing <laughs> Uh, yeah you know generic middle eastern country that gets invaded oh, in water that one wow wow I mean, <laughs> just i've got nothing to say to that <laughs> i blame video games for this oh no don't go down that road <laughs> you know the next thing we know this little snippet of you saying i blame video games is going to be on fox news and them saying you know famous indian <laughs> kickstarter developer says he blames video games <laughs> no fox news he's not famous yeah, he's, yeah fox he's news wouldn't publish arvind is an f lift celebrity man it's not <laughs> famous come on no fox news wouldn't publish it because i'm an indian yeah so they like oh yeah they had the first third in <laughs> oh well times now it was a good attempt but yeah vivek you were saying 
I forgot what I was saying because Arvind interrupted me and said I was from Saudi Arabia. You were saying like, you were something about uh, strapping yourself with dynamite and running at a wall of an embassy. No, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying like billing it, billing it does make a difference if people start not just, not necessarily taking risks, but if people start making games and start making the games they want to make. I think that's the biggest problem. Well, yeah, again, like it falls into the category of my opinion. I, I I could be completely wrong. I think the biggest problem with our industry right now is people are not making the games that they want to play. You know? Yeah. Uh, but I think I think you have to want to make and want to play the games that you're making. That that's kind of a must. Yeah, but you know, there's also a major problem of funding. That yeah, okay, if you're working indie and working on by yourself. You can you can get by with that you know you can make something you like but you know the added uh, I would say uh, pressure for a lot of uh, Indian uh, devs is you know the family pressure that you also have you know think about it you like uh, Indian culture has generally have like you know you take you take care of your parents you take care of your your immediate and sometimes even extended family because it's just the way it is. So, you know, being an indie in that sort of situation, especially, especially in a family that expects this, is not is not something you can do. And the people who are funding games, they expect, you know, um, they expect, you know, okay, this is mobiles are the big boom right now. So we need to make a mobile game like this, which is famous, but we'll change it a little. Or we need to incorporate these mechanics because these are famous and so on and so forth. So there is a bit of a you know issue with just saying that um, you know make the games you want to make. There we do have a massive uh, shortage of funders or people who are willing to fund and trust the de- uh, developers to do something. But I, yeah, I, I think that's maybe true in case of wanting to make a large AAA game. But if you are being smart and you look at the mobile market, you know that right now it's oversaturated. It's it's riskier to make a mobile game now. It's like it's essentially like throwing something at a wall and hoping it sticks. That's a mobile game right now because that market is oversaturated. It's it's probably smarter to aim at the PC or to aim at any other like aim at aim even at the Ouya for God's sake, you know, because those markets are not they're not overcrowded. Like the Ouya right now is empty. If you make a good game for it, chances are people will buy it. But you know, I I, I still think that. There's, uh, you know, we understand that from our perspective, but from a numbers perspective, you know, an executive who has classical business training, he sees the numbers for mobile and those are still, you know, particularly. Yeah, high. but those are the numbers for their top games, man. Yeah, like, but those are the numbers for their top 10 or top yeah, 20, you know. But that's the usual executive thing, right? Like everyone yeah. uh, 10 years ago was looking at World of Warcraft and thinking, yeah, that's the numbers you want to get. Nobody was looking at the... 50 failed World of Warcraft clones and thinking... Hmm. Well, no, see, World of Warcraft is not, like, it's not World of Warcraft of failure, man. There's EVE Online. That's lasted just just as long as World of yeah, Warcraft. Yeah, but that's, that's an exception too, you know. Like, there are countless MMOs that it's, were made. It's, it's, see, it's a sustainable business model. Even if you look at, there's, it's not the exception. Look at the guys who made City of Heroes. That also lasted a really long time. It, it shut down eventually. But for a, for the kind of MMO it was, it lasted a really long time. It's a sustainable business model to make a game for a particular audience and to make sure that you can get as much of a market share of that audience as possible. It's a very sustainable business model. Make the game you want to make for the players you know will play it, you know, or the players you know who will pay money for it. And try and make sure that you can reach as many of them as possible. The mobile audience, no such thing exists right now. You can't predict any... Oh, fine, there are really smart people who can predict patterns in mobile audiences. I won't say that. There are people who can predict, you know, how to sell a game to a mobile audience. But by and large, I don't think I don't think that expertise has reached here yet, you know, to understand what to make for whom. So we should stick to making the games that we've grown up playing. Most Indian developers have grown up playing games on PC or on console. So make the games that you want to play, na? Like it's 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 simple. You don't have to make this huge AAA RPG, that's insane. Yes, you don't have 20, 30 million dollars lying around. But you can make a like you can make an indie version of a cool side scroller. You can make an indie RPG. It's not unheard of. It's not outside the realm of possibility. Uh Ashwin, you've been quiet for a bit. What do you think about all this? Well, I I think I have 
a leg in each of these boats. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. It depends on your priorities, really. If you are in it uh-huh. for the life, I think you would tend towards making a game that you can make with it within the constraints that you have, but something mm-hmm. that you would have to play. On the other hand, um, right. if if you're clever enough about making a game, a small game, even for the mobile market, you can make one which is not enormously successful but good enough that can keep you afloat. So making a game that you just want to play, it's a risk, mm-hmm. a huge risk. But there are right. enough and more companies out there that make passable games that don't innovate, but they do mm-hmm. well enough to to sustain. So it's right. just a question of choice, really, what you want to do. One one probably the golden mean that I'll go for is if you're starting out with a company, make safe bets for the first couple of or maybe first couple of years where you make enough money to probably take a risk after that. So yeah, that's what I think. Uh-huh. Is. I but isn't is generally what happens is once you've made enough money, you don't want to take risks with it, right? Depends. That's what everyone says. That's what everyone says that we're going to go safe and stable and steady for the first three years. And then we're going to have enough money to take big risks to make the games we want to make. What happens is you go safe and steady and stable. And if you're very, very lucky, that works out and you have enough money to take the risk. But once you have the money, you don't want to take the risk. True, true. Uh, and yeah, because I wouldn't say that is wrong. I wouldn't say that yeah, is wrong. I would say if that is what you feel three years, don't make that game. Simple enough. Nobody's forcing you. Yeah, That's but like, I mean, if you don't like sure. making games three years, don't. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, okay. From from my end, I would like to see this uh, industry go into a more uh, mechanics-heavy strategy genre. But you know, that's wishful thinking on my part. Uh, and that's all I really have to say about uh, you know what I what uh, direction I'd like to see the Indian games industry head in. Uh, Moving on to news, I think, uh, unless anybody has anything more to say, like any final thoughts anybody wants to add or, you know, we can push on. I only put in a large disclaimer and say that anything I was saying, like, I didn't want to, I don't want to offend anybody with what I was saying. It's just my opinion. And I have a relatively strong opinion. Yeah, I believe. I, I might be entirely wrong about it. I, I, I believe yeah, it's I understood it's that true. these are all opinions. Yeah. So, okay. So moving on to news, uh, it's. Uh, Arvind made a joke about this last time. I'm sure our few listeners may have caught it. Um, it's uh, based off of a interview with Justin Broder, who is a uh, lead designer at Blizzard uh, for their uh, Heroes of the S- uh, Storm. Uh, yeah, that's it. So in a <clears throat> in an interview with um, uh, Rock Paper Shotgun, uh, they were talking about the game, and you know it. It's worth mentioning that they were running out of time before this question was posed. So, um, you know, with barely a minute to go, um, the interviewer decides to broach the topic of uh, female character design, uh, basically stating that, you know, nowadays you have, you know, a a fairly large enough uh, female audience. And if you're aiming to make heroes that are generally awesome, uh, open quotes, uh, they should be awesome for everybody and not just one uh, one uh, group of uh, gamers. And to that, um, you know, his response at the time was a little icy, a little, um, you know, uh, let's not talk about this or let's not go down this road sort, uh, sort of feel. And then, you know, he ran out of time and that's where it ended. So they couldn't really fully flesh out this discussion. So, you know, he then wrote up a second article just basically discussing uh, what uh, he thought about, uh, you know, uh, character design in, you know, uh, female character design in uh, games, especially MOBAs, because they have a larger uh, character pool and, you know, each character is supposed to stand out and is supposed to be, you know, interesting. But if you look at it, generally, the female characters are more along the sides uh, or you know, less uh, clad in most respects than their male counterparts. You know, you also have a certain very um, limited age group and, you know, uh, and uh, kind of body type that the female characters have. Whereas with males, you always see, you know, guys who are, you know, fat, guys who are ugly, who look good, who have scars, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, different ages, you know, all around the board. And there's a lot more diversity. you know, diversity there. And, and 
Um, so he basically said that we need to, you know, move away from this sort of uh, mentality. And I believe the next day uh, there was a blog post on the Heart of uh, uh, Heart of Heroes of the Storm uh, blog by uh, Justin Broder, basically apologizing for this, right? So, you know, uh, yeah, like it's obvious that they do need to change and all, but I'm just, you know, uh, wondering what you guys thought about the interview or, you know, the general um, the general uh, disposition that people have that, you know, it's not as much of a problem as, it, you know, most other gamers would believe, especially devs would maybe a little bit more uh, defensive about this. Um, should we start with Arvind? Uh, yeah, I don't really know what to say. I mean, on one hand, I, I don't really play a lot of MOBAs, but I have seen some of the stories on the wiki as preparation for this. And like, I, I seriously regret the time I spent reading the character backstories because they were pretty terrib- terribly written. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not like, this is a pretty endem- uh, big problem in the entire games industry, but uh, yeah, I, I don't really know what, like, it's pretty obvious what needs to be done to solve this problem. But yet, right. I don't know, maybe like maybe the Blizzard people have access to some numbers or something that we don't have. Or, or I don't know what the reason is. So yeah, not really much I can suggest apart from just, you know, make more diver- diverse characters. But Right. What sure about what you, Vivek? What Armin said, more or less, uh, I mean, uh, but yeah, I don't know. The interview in general, I, I think, I think it was, it could have been a, an interview among the series, amongst the series of interviews. And once the guy got drilled on something like sex, sexism, uh, I, I think his hackers rose pretty quickly because maybe it's the, you know, we don't know. It could have been the twenty fifth interview in a day in which he had thirty interviews to give. So yeah. maybe he said something that you know he wouldn't have said if it had been the first. Uh, that being said, like he he didn't show any tact in the way he spoke, mm-hmm. and uh, it's understandable that like he kind of got a little, little bit of he kind of got reamed for it by the RPS guy. Yeah, it's understandable that that happened. Right. As for the portrayal, yeah, I mean, like all you need to do is it's it's not that you don't need you can't have you know good looking or sexualized female characters in video games. It's just that you need a much more diverse array of female characters in video games as opposed to you know one it's essentially it's it's pretty much one uh they're, they're all almost all the women women in video games are white and they have one body type which is yeah it's kind of dumb i mean uh yeah that's my okay and ashwin yeah i i would like to look at it from another perspective if you're mm-hmm. making a game that you want to reach out to all all kinds of players because that's where the most money is right when you look at it from a strictly right. business point of view that's that's where right. you pay your money is. why would you want to alienate half of the human race so yes yeah if you just look at it that way it's a dumb move if you want to want your game to reach out and influence and be enjoyable to a to the maximum number of people just make sure you you have like vivek said a, a diverse array of characters and in fact, even as a gamer, I find it monotonous many times. Finding the, the, the mm-hmm. same person, when it's mm-hmm. a woman, it's the same person yeah. in almost every game out there. Right. And we don't play generic shooters anymore, do we? Because they're boring. We have been doing yeah. the same thing over and over again. And that's when something new that comes up, like I think Super Hot, catches on because it's new. So I think people are starting to expect the same thing from characters. And it's it's not just women; it's all kinds of diversity. Uh, do we have interesting uh, characters who are differently able, maybe different races, who were never portrayed in video games before? So I think mm-hmm. the the demand for more variety, more diversity, is coming up, and it's a good thing. Gaming will yeah. be all the more richer for it. Though so sometimes I, think, I look uh... at games like Bioshock Infinite and think maybe it was better if they didn't have people of other races because you know oh come on man Dude. you haven't even played Bioshock Infinite come on no, I have played it out. but yeah seriously oh, you, you, haven't played yeah, you know Infinite. what I mean when I say the the parts in Bioshock Infinite you know so 
Yeah, I have played it. Like, I mean, I, I uh, whatever. I'm not having an argument with you about Bioshock Infinite. You're wrong. Arvind is wrong. Yeah, and you are racist. So whatever. If, yeah. I'm. Whatever. <laughs> Even though we know nothing about why you're wrong, he's just wrong, right? Yes. Oh. He is. He's wrong. Okay. The Tejas well, would uh, say that. Tejas is basically a younger version of Ken Levine. So. Oh, am I? Wow. Yeah, without the talent. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. I was waiting for the addendum. Um, <laughs> in in regards to this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Bro. Arvind, do you think Ken Levine is talented? Yeah. I mean, yeah, he was at some point. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> you're such a you're such a douchebag, man. Uh, Right. Um, I, no, I, I, I think I, I, I don't know that the por- like, like, just to address Arvind's point, I don't know the portrayal of people of color in Bioshock Infinite is is necessarily problematic. What he's trying to say, what Ken Levine does in every game of his essentially is is say that once you use extreme methods to to get your point across, then you become like it's that Nietzsche thing, right? Uh, don't hunt monsters lest you become one right it's no, that think, it's that uh, the problem i have specifically is that like uh, now what it tries to imply is that if you give power to the you know the other side then they will ob- obviously become as evil as the person no i don't think i don't think that's what it's trying to imply but i doesn't think it's that, trying to imply that, that when, when you use when you're willing lady, to use so. violence to get your get to get your point across there's very little difference between you and the oppressor. Yeah. Yes, it does it in a very ham-fisted way. It does it in a very ham-fisted and silly kind of way. And it... Like, I think he he's done this one too many times. He did the same thing in Bioshock. And when you do the same thing again and again, it, it starts to wear thin. But aside from that, I, I don't think he's intentionally trying to say that, like, you know, oh, if you give power to black people they're going to become as savage as the white people were i i think that's absurd no, yeah, i think, I think he's the, saying that my, the problem is that he's not trying to say that but there's a definite undercurrent which i feel is there which which i don't really which i don't really like you know to put it mildly but yeah well yes you made it clear that you don't like it i i don't know i, I never got that the feeling that i got was that he's trying to say the same thing he said in bioshock wherein like he's like oh, hardcore objectivism like Andrew Ryan is bad, but hardcore capitalism like Atlas is also bad. And here yeah, it's, it's you know hardcore South racism is bad. Kind of just, thing, yeah. Huh? Hardcore racism is no, no, bad, no. but hard South Park centrism centrism, which is you know, like, like South Park is like every side is bad except the people who have no opinion about anything and we get to feel superior. You know how it is. Yeah. yeah. Don't know. I, yeah, I guess so. I haven't watched South Park in way too long, so I, I don't really care. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think I, I I think he just says that once you use violence to get your political point across, you become like your point of view becomes as war- it becomes warped. The thing that you're think, trying to. I think what he says is that if you start killing babies, you become evil. Yeah, I think that's uh-huh. what he's trying to say. <laughs> yes, like I said, it's <laughs> and it, it loses its power because he's done it before. Yeah. But I don't know that it's I don't know that it's as problematic as you think it is. But anyway, that's yeah. That was I, I, I thought, yeah. This was a, an amazing tangent, really. Uh, coming back to the topic of diversity in games, uh, what what do you think about uh, you know the ge- you know the general public that does buy, considering only at the moment AAA games, which have major budgets and have the most uh, market penetration with a lot of non gamers as well. What, how do you think someone who in an year buys maybe three or four big budget titles because they're widely, how would they react to uh, diversity? Like, for example, if in uh, uh, GTA f- uh, 5, one of the characters was Indian and with all the perspectives and uh, the add-ons that, that are added in for being, you know, an Indian, probably someone who's just uh, gone to a, a Western country. I bet you'd get a shit ton of Let's Play YouTube videos with the Indian guy driving a cab. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, like, okay, seriously. Do you think it would affect numbers? Like, uh, um, you know, Arvind, what do you think? No, I don't think so. No? So, oh, wait, I, I didn't so. get the question. I, I, your voice cut out for me. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Vivek, why don't you repeat it? If in Grand Theft Auto V, one of the main characters was Indian, do you think the current AAA game buying audience would like do you think that would affect sales <laughs> no like grand theft auto is a 
is a juggernaut. Like Grand Theft Auto could do anything. It could become totally crazy, like Saints Row. It could Grand Theft Auto could release three bad games in a row, and it, it, they would still break sales numbers because it is a cultural juggernaut. I don't think they are at the point where if they don't have every single protagonist as the default single white male who can not single, but like you know, white male kind of yeah. person. I don't think like Grand Theft Auto is beyond that point. Like they had the, their last uh, protagonist as a whiny uh, European immigrant, right? And nobody like that didn't affect sales numbers. So yeah, I, I think you're missing the point. It wasn't specifically for GTA, but uh, more of the you know deferred uh, viewpoint and perspective. Uh, no, the problem well, with that. You specifically said GTA. Well, you specifically said GTA. Yeah, I was using that as an example, but it, you know, it was just a shell for. Okay, never. Yeah, mind. I think the problem with that is that let's say you want an Indian character in there. Okay, so then the problem mm-hmm. is that unless you have some input from somebody who is an Indian, and uh, then your like it's just another. Uh, it it becomes kind of like you know how. Uh, like the the usual like if I were to uh, depict an American in a TV show or something, so then my op- opinion would be decided by what I see on TV and movies. So it becomes kind right. of like that, and like especially in games like Grand Theft Auto, like I can understand that their viewpoint is like write what you know, you know, because they because characters commit some really bad things, and like if you you don't want to. Uh, needlessly step into a lot of landmines, but yeah, on the other hand, yeah, some diversity would be welcome, especially like if a mainstream uh, franchise like GTA decides to st- set a precedent. You know, like maybe in the next game they can have three protagonists and none of them are white male persons. I don't think that would affect sales. Like, GTA is pretty big, so if you're talking about it in general as a larger kind of thing, if uh, you can have Indian characters in video games, that's a harder sell. Maybe depending on the kind of games you're making, if the protagonist of something like say Splinter Cell was an Indian, the context of that game changes in a very dramatic way, right? Right. You know, that's what I mean. Like, if you have, you know, a AAA game where you know, the whole context is based off of a different culture, opposed to what, what we see currently, which is, you know, mostly a Western perspective to things. Yeah, that's how... a kind of like uh, two schools of thought. In that, the one school of thought says... That if you have a person that is not the default person, then you have a then they should be based around being a character. So, if you want to write a story about featuring an Indian protagonist, then their story would have to revolve around being Indian, because the general audience doesn't know what it's like. So the story has to. And another perspective is that you just write whatever story you want and just make the character. Uh, Put that character in that story and, and just figure out how they deal with it instead of the uh, the entire story. Them being driven by their identity. Yeah, and their identity being their uh, race or like something they are not in control of. Like I don't. Right. Like, we we are not in what in control of our skin color, for example. You know. So. Well, you know, Michael Jackson was, so I think we can. <laughs> <laughs> what too soon? Uh, <laughs> But uh, what what do you think, Ashwin? Uh, re- you know, regarding all of this. Yeah, maybe I should start from the. I think GTA is where this originally sparked off. This yes. Discussion. So well, I don't think this kind of thing can be predicted at all. That's my feeling. Okay. Like, yeah, there are so many variables involved. How how can you really pin down the success of a game? Or say 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 we do this to a game, and the game comes out and it could do well. It could might not do well. How do you establish a strict causality between the color of a character and the skills of a game. It's all guesswork, is it not? So It is. And the, a lot I did, yeah, largely the business is a crap shoot, crap shoot uh, uh, Ashwin, but certain franchises will always do well. GTA 5, there was never a doubt in anyone's head that it's going to make a billion dollars in the first three days. Right? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 don't, like, like, I think I stand with what Arvind said here, essentially, wherein... It doesn't affect games like GTA 5, whether or not you have an Indian protagonist or don't have an Indian protagonist. Those rules apply to other AAA games, hmm. but not necessarily to the juggernauts in in gaming. I, yeah, I think I, I also I also agree with you guys. Uh, these are special cases, outliers. GTA, right. no matter, even, even Call of Duty to an extent, I think they have a certain leeway with, with, with experimenting, which... It's a it's a license that they have chosen not to exercise so far, I believe. 
but still mm-hmm. yeah i think so i think the case uh, i think home front home front tried to do something hmm. different a triple a game, but it failed uh i don't think they did try and do anything in the same you know um you know caucasian yeah. pro- protagonist against the others and there there was no difference of perspective like they showed uh, north korea attacking but there was no commentary on you know the atra- atrocities that were committed on you know to them and why they would be upset they were the very you know a very bland yes we are evil because we are sort of enemy yeah like you so, could have basically replaced them their logo with the swastika and there would be no difference yeah more we're so evil we're going to take your children and make them walking mechs that you have to kill in the end <laughs> no my, my yeah i'm trying to say if gta or call of duty had done the same thing according to your mm-hmm. argument they would have killed it would they that's my question yeah yes yeah if, if if call of duty had done north korea invading the united states I think they have done it better than Homefront, <laughs> and okay. they would have sold more copies. Even but if they I, didn't you know, do it better than Homefront, honest, they would have still uh, sold more copies. To be honest, copies. to decide that, like I would have to play COD Ghosts and Homefront, and like I am not God. strong enough to subject myself to that that kind of. <laughs> I don't think anyone is. Yeah. I don't think anyone. <laughs> okay, um, you know, uh, to interrupt you guys, I think you know my original question may have been a little uh, sidetracked with the GTA example. What I meant to say is that. let let's say there's a new triple a ip coming out with a different perspective it has nothing to back oh, it up yeah the it has it's is, absolutely uh, new and uh one second over i get what uh, ashwin says that this is you know something that you cannot realistically predict that uh, um you know that if it turns out to be a really great game people yes people will buy it people will talk about it but what about initial um you know reactions you know or let's say a trailer just comes out and you know people realize that hey this is very different from what i'm used to especially for you know like i said the core triple a audience which is not you know like a, a gamer that goes for multiple experiences throughout the year but sticks to maybe four or five you know stuff that they expect and then suddenly there's a new uh triple a that says yes this is the next big thing how would they react to that do you expect no, that think, you know, yeah what you think no uh, no i think that the main problem here is that there's no way to ab test this you you can like yeah. you can yes. release two exactly the same games one with a female protagonist one with a male protagonist or one with a indian protagonist one with a caucasian protagonist that cannot happen and what and what usually hap- tends to happen is that let's say remember me doesn't sell well so then you'll have two or three idiot analysts come on and uh, come on interview and said say that this means that games with female protagonists won't sell but if right to retribution fails that doesn't mean that games with male protagonists are doomed so that yeah, kind of selective <laughs> yeah, that kind of selective uh, picking of uh, evidence in quotation marks happens a lot and that's what results in like games uh, you know supposedly being catered to the same thing okay yeah uh, makes sense uh, does anybody have anything else to add about diversity in games more of it i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no like uh, Ash, uh, arvin you were earlier saying that you know there are two ways to look at narrative when you're doing characters from you know different ethnicities and stuff like that one is yes. you make them driven like you make their identity driven by who they are mm. and dealing with who they are and the other is you just write them as a normal person mm. and with certain and let that be let that determine how they deal with the world right mm, yeah yeah and and crucially like so, what i meant with, was uh, like if if i like if i am writing about somebody whose identity i am not familiar with like if i am writing about a person let's say if i am writing about a story about a character dealing with apartheid for example you know so i i meant in that respect like if you're writing something you are not familiar with in that respect but i mean if you're writing a story about a character dealing with apartheid you like what is more important than apartheid in that situation you have to make it yeah. about that character dealing with apartheid right i mean yeah exactly <laughs> like yeah that that was probably not the best example but yeah what i was saying was that if you are writing about a character whose experiences you are not familiar with okay yeah no so for uh, what my question is for unrest what approach are you, are you taking uh yeah we we are researching a lot of like history 
mainly and uh, historical literature how certain other books have done that and yeah but in the end i guess we are just trying to write them like uh, characters who are uh, like you know what what i think a character how a character would have behaved in that according to the social customs at that time and according to the political situation at that time that kind of thing Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, Arvind, when you say you're, uh, you know, reading into older documents, are you, uh, what sort of, uh, uh, what sort of reading material are you guys, have you guys hit so far? Is it more, you know, older short stories and stuff that were written by, let's say, uh, Ravindranath Tagore, or are you looking at more, you know, actual historical, factual uh, documents? More towards uh, historical facts, actually, because. Yeah, I think like if you read up on history and the customs and such, it's it's probably uh, I think it would probably be uh, better to like obviously I've I've also read <laughs> Rabindranath Tagore, you know, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it would be easier if we could we we had to filter through one less lens of opinion, you know, like right. if you read an author of what somebody else, it's, it's, it's kind of too many layers. It's like in Metro twenty thirty three when. it's translated in english of russian characters making jokes about russia through by watching american movies about russian villains you know <laughs> that becomes like too many lenses to filter through right but yeah anyway uh, uh arvind i like i have a book recommendation for you i don't know if you find it necessarily useful but uh, check out a book called 1857 the real story of the great uprising it's the story of a common uh, a common guy who got stuck inside uh, the fort of uh, the rani of jhansi when it was being sieged by the british oh okay uh, that's that's probably more recent than yeah but yeah i'll check it out yeah he gives an like he gives a completely detailed account of what happened and how the looting happened and you know uh, yeah. sounds pretty interesting and how he escaped alive okay i it's about a story of a priest Okay, I I can't help but uh, notice that uh, Arvind, you said that's a bit more recent. How far back are you looking? Uh, you know, for uh, ancient India. You know, at at the time where uh, like are you talking was, uh, more more ancient? Gupta Empire. Uh, 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 oh, okay. Sort of that. Yeah. Okay. Gupta, like Chandragupta Maurya and all that, right? Yeah. No, Chandragupta okay. Maurya was the Maurya Empire. I mean, the Gupta Empire. You know, the one that came after the Maurya Empire. Gupta and Chandragupta the second. Wait, uh, Ashwin, you broke up. What did you say? Oh, no, I was just butting in saying that Samudra Gupta and Chandra Gupta the second. Yeah, but... yeah, right. Yeah, I think that the Chandra Gupta and the second and Chandra Gupta Maurya are different. Yeah, they are. They are. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, okay, so oh, that's that's super early. That's like the. Yeah. That... The... <laughs> Wait. Wow. So were you actually thinking that this was about the? uh like war against the british kind of thing all this yeah thing. i was no 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 i i thought i thought you guys were set uh, in, in more in like medieval india so 1400s so oh. no, no, uh, no i was actually expecting something you know from the 1700s to the 1800s you know that you know 200 years span that's, somewhere that's like yeah that's like the british rule time right yeah more or less like i was expecting something within But, that time period or at least that's british, uh, that's what i thought British rule started from 1857. Technically, the British started ruling us after the mutiny, because then they said that they they said that the East India Company decided that the East India Company was incompetent, and they took over. Oh, yeah, like I I consider the East India Company to actually like during the time that they had a lot of control. Yeah, but yeah, like I guess officially, but yeah. Okay. Hmm. Anyway, you should check it out. It's. Uh, It's a really good book. Like it's a good first-person account, which is rare these days. Eighteen fifty-seven, the real story of the Great Uprising. Interesting, but okay. I guess uh, I think this is a good place to wrap it up. We've had a nice little bunch of segues, totally unplanned for, but that's you know what makes it awesome. So uh, let's uh, let's all say goodbye. So Arvin. Bye. <laughs> that that was okay. Uh, Ashwin. See ya. And Vivek. You guys. Also, it's Tejas's birthday, so yes. Happy birthday! Happy birthday, Tejas! I I, I want to give a speech like uh, Bilbo Baggins at this point. You know, 25 oh. years is you know 
far too short Lord. to spend. <laughs> I stopped recording. Huh. Yeah.